I'm going to be in Ephesians chapter 5 as we continue our look at uh, what I've been calling a gospel-shaped marriage and uh, to look at how uh, the Word of God tells us that marriage and the relationships in our home, um, especially marriage between a man and a wife, are something designed and used by God to proclaim the glory of the Lord Jesus Christ and to picture for us his relationship to his own bride, to the church. Let's begin by praying and asking for the Lord's help as we read his word, that his Holy Spirit would illuminate these truths to us. Father God, this morning we ask that you would meet us here in your word, that by your Holy Spirit you would illuminate truth to us, and that we would receive it in our minds and in our hearts, and that it would translate into a more godly way of thinking, a more godly way of relating to one another, of speaking, of behaving. And uh, Father, that in all things you would use your word, not only to build stronger families, to build those who mentor um, those who are married, not only to, to instruct those who are married to, to live happier lives with one another and more godly lives, but Father, that in all these things, we would see the love of Jesus Christ for his people. Father, we pray that the love and the light and the truth of the gospel of Jesus Christ would shine above all things. Nevertheless, Father, we pray that in a very real and immediate sense, you would bless our marriages, the marriages that we are in, the marriages that we draw upon those experiences as we mentor those around us, as we encourage and instruct and walk with others who are married. Father, that you would truly bring to us truth for each and every one of us, regardless of our relationship with this idea of marriage at this moment, that you'd instruct all of us to see the glory of what you've done and what you're able to do and of what Jesus Christ is to his people. Help us, Father, now we pray. In the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, amen. Well, let's begin by reading from Scripture, and let's read from verse 25 down through verse 33, though this morning we'll only consider a portion of this. Let's capture the whole chunk here. Verse 25 And Ephesians 5 reads this way, Husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her, that he might sanctify her, having cleansed her by the washing of water with the word, so that he might present the church to himself in splendor, without spot or wrinkle or any such thing, that she might be holy and without blemish. In the same way, husbands should love their wives as their own bodies. He who loves his wife loves himself. For no one ever hated his own flesh, but nourishes and cherishes it, just as Christ does the church, because we are members of his body. Therefore a man shall leave his father and mother and hold fast to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. This is a profound mystery, and I'm saying that it refers to Christ and the church. However, let each one of you love his wife as himself, and let the wife see that she respects her husband. Self-care is a buzzword in our day. Self-love, self-care. It goes along with self-love and nothing, nothing we need be told to do. We don't have a problem loving ourselves, but we do need to learn to do that in healthy ways. I think one of the greatest lies in our culture right now is that we've been told so often you need to learn to love yourself before you can love someone else. We hear that all the time, but you will never find that in the Bible. And you may say, well, don't we hear that here? And I would suggest to you that today you're going to see the difference between the way the world says you need to love yourself first before you can love others or love your wife and what the Bible means when it says that a husband should love his wife as his own body. Those two things are different. We all, without exception, as human beings, 
love ourselves. We need to be taught to do that in right ways, in healthy ways, and we need to be taught what it means that we would love ourselves or love others as ourselves while acknowledging that we are to love God above all things and put others before self, that those are not contradictions. But what the world says and what the Bible says are different. And so when we speak of love, and when we speak of loving others as ourself, we need to be careful to take our cues from Scripture and not from popular pop psychology. The health and wellness industry is booming. Society, people, they clamor for better ways to love themselves and mostly, I'd say, out of vanity or out of pride or some for health and good stewardship. It's not all bad. It's not all wrong. But the point is that we will go to great lengths to promote health and wellness in hopes of a better life, meaning that we believe that it's important that you take some action and that if you do take some action, something will get better. It's going somewhere. We're not already as good as we ought to be. We're always striving to somehow be better, but that requires making choices. It requires doing something intentionally. We can't just want to be in better shape. We've got to do something to be in better shape. And the list goes on. And I would say it's fair that God's law captures this. Remember what the lawyer asks, right? What is the greatest commandment? Jesus asks him if he knows in some cases, and the guy will say, well, you're supposed to love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, with all your strength, and love your neighbor as yourself. Jesus reiterates that, that the first greatest commandment is to love God with all that you are. And the second is that you'd love your neighbor as yourself. Those are the two great tables of the law. Love God first. It's at least the first four commandments. And the next six are about loving our neighbor. Paul says in Romans that the whole law is summed up in this. In love. You love others. You love God first and you love others as yourself. That is fulfilling the law. Love doesn't do harm to others. Even the golden rule. Right? Do unto others. Should have them do unto you. Right? We, we, we understand that there's something about the way we want to be taken care of, the way we understand what it means to be loved, to be cared for. And that's natural. It's not taught that we should love ourselves. It's assumed that we do. Now, some people do that in really destructive ways, thinking wrongly that some wrong and hurtful and painful and sinful things are actually loving to themselves and good for themselves. The problem is not that they don't love themselves. The problem is that sin has distorted what is actually good for a person, what's actually helpful for a person. We don't need to be told to love ourselves. That's natural. But what we need to do is to learn how to do that Truly, biblically, physically, emotionally, mentally, spiritually, with all our heart, soul, mind, body, strength. And with those thoughts in mind, then there are at least two big ideas I think we should come away with here. One, that we should love our wives, husbands, as our own bodies. And two, that we should thankfully and lovingly receive the love and care of the Lord Jesus Christ for his church. Husbands, you have a unique position in that in some ways you are both a bride and a husband. As part of the church, you are part of a bride who is loved by your husband, Jesus Christ. By the way, that could be helpful thought in tempering how unsatisfied we may get with our wives when if we were to compare what kind of wife they were and what kind of wife we are, they're much better than us <laughs> in so many ways. Nevertheless, we are loved this way. We can help encourage others to love this way. We can help encourage our husbands, wives, to love us in this way and support this role. We have said already that headship in the home is indispensable and it is first and foremost and primarily a spiritual matter. If we are not leading our homes in biblical, spiritual ways, for the spiritual good of our families, then we are not the head of our home, period. Because if you're not doing that, you're not fulfilling the greatest call for a husband. 
Yes, you should make sure they eat. We'll cover all those things. Yes, you should take care of them. Yes, you should. Any number of things that husbands should do. But first and foremost, we are called to be loving our wives like Christ. Well, let's jump in then where we left off last week at verse 28. We talked about this spiritual aspect of the role of being ahead of the house. And we saw that Christ, his work for the church was to make her holy. It, it, it emphasizes the supreme importance of like, does Christ make sure we have breath every day? Yes, every day that he wants us to be alive, he does. And does he provide for us to eat? Yes, and shelter and all those things? Yes. But what's the greatest thing Christ has done? He saved our souls. Now, husbands, you're not able to save your wives, but it does speak to the fact that as a head in your home, this is the most primary thing that you can do for your home, which is to be a spiritual leader. And that doesn't mean you've got to be perfect. That doesn't mean you have to be perfect in your sanctification. You don't have to be Christ-like. You don't have to be able to do miracles. You don't have to do any of those things. What it means is you regard the things of God as the most important in your family. That in everything, even in your mistakes, that when you think about the truth of God's word, you understand the importance of coming back, of confession, of repentance, of humility, of guarding your home. And we'll cover some of these things. But notice how verse 28 starts, in the same way. In the same way as what? Well, that's usually a reference to what came before. Verse 25 through 27, we see that Christ was intent on glorifying his church in himself, making her holy, Christ the head, church the body. We saw that authority and submission bring unity and maturity, just like a kid that grows. And eventually the head learns to talk to the body parts. And when they become more unified and more mature, then what the brain is telling the arms and legs to do, they do better. And the body parts submit to the head. And the more they do that, the more able we are. And when there's a disconnect between the mind and the body parts, things there's dysfunction, there's struggle. And in the same way with the husband and the wife, Christ in the church, when there's biblical headship and authority and biblical submission, what that brings is not one better and one worse. What that brings is unity and maturity, greater function, greater ability, greater glory to God. Authority and submission are both done out of love and unity and maturity bring about glory. So the whole thing works together. Authority and submission in love for each other and for God bring about unity and maturity, which brings about glory for God, which is the greatest intent of all things. It is the chief end of all creation. Husbands should love in like fashion. They should care for the body to promote health, unity, wholeness, strength, ability. Isn't that what we do, gentlemen, when we try to care for our bodies? We make sure they're healthy, that they're all in one piece and that they're whole, that they're strong enough to do what we need to do and that we do what we're called to do. We know how to care for our bodies. Sometimes we don't do it very well. Sometimes we get an idea about what we think would be good for our bodies, but, but we understand what it means to care for a body. But see there where Paul quotes all the way at the beginning, the two shall become one flesh. Just let that sink in for a second. The two shall become one flesh. There is some truth behind the idea that you've heard the saying, haven't you, right? Happy wife, happy life. It's meant maybe a little facetiously, but there's some truth to it. That's why people say that. Because even at its worst, it understands this notion that between a man and a woman who are married, there is a oneness and what happens with one affects the other. We may not show it in the same way. We may not always understand it. But if there's a genuine oneness there, when one hurts, the other hurts in some way. What one goes through, the other goes through. And even if the other one is clueless, what he or she does not understand is this thing happening with the one does and will affect the other. And if you don't want that to come out wrongly, 
What's good is to have unity and openness and honesty and deal with that because it acknowledges that I cannot and am not to try to go through this thing on my own. I am not myself anymore. I am one with this other person and I must live like I am one with this other person. If you don't care well for your body, your experience of life is diminished. If you don't care well for your wife, your experience of life is diminished. Not just in a superficial way. We're also not going to see all that we are to see about how Christ loves the church. She's not going to see everything that it means and should mean to her when she hears that Christ is our groom and she is a bride and when she thinks about what kind of a husband you are gentlemen what picture are you giving her about how well jesus christ loves her you can affect that how ought you to care for your body well verse 29 tells us how you care for your body no one ever hated his own flesh but nourishes and cherishes it just as christ does the church Sin has deceived us. It has distorted our understanding of what's good. It has degraded the value of man and the priorities for care and attention of physical over the spiritual to just make sure we are healthy, wealthy, well-fed, strong. We have jobs. We do all these things physically, but we're not caring for our spirits or those under our care. That's wrong, and that's a distortion. But it's also not good to simply say, I'm only concerned with spiritual things while your family starves, while you don't provide for them, while you don't take care of yourself or others, we're whole. And so we care for ourselves and it's the world and wrongness that would separate those things so that some part of what it means to be alive and to be well is neglected. The first thing we would do is to nourish. This word used here in 529 is only ever used one other place and it's in the next chapter where Paul writes in Ephesians 6, 4, Fathers, do not provoke your children to anger, but bring them up in the discipline and instruction of the Lord. That bring them up is, this, is, the, same, um, is the same word. This word means to nourish up to maturity, to nurture, to bring up. Can you hear the emphasis on, the, on bringing the object of what's being nourished up? to make it better, to make it more complete. This isn't simply just feeding something. This is nurturing it to the point of bringing it to a more complete state. There is action that's required. There's input that needs to be provided. There's care that's required to nourish, to bring up. It's going somewhere. We nourish our bodies to get them somewhere better. Nextly, we cherish. That word is only here. And in 1 Thessalonians 2, and we'll, we'll look at that here in a second. This word also kind of means to warm up, to foster with tender love and care, right? It's exactly what's going on. To foster, to care, to be near, to be tender. To foster also implies this notion that we're going somewhere with this. We're getting to some better state. The implication then is of nearness, of caution, of intimacy, again, with an intent, with a purpose going forward. Both of those words convey the idea of intentional, positive, active posture and approach to loving one's wife or caring for his body. Isn't that what we saw in verses 26 and 27, before Paul said, in the same way, what is Christ doing? He's washing her. He's making her holy. He's intentionally, positively, actively doing something to get the church somewhere better. And so Paul says, in the same way, you nourish and cherish. You intentionally, positively, actively love your wife like you would your body to get to a better place. Well, let's look, let's look at that verse. If you flip over just a few pages, I don't know how many pages in your Bible, to 1 Thessalonians 2. Let me just read this passage here where these words or words like them are used in 1 Thessalonians 2. I'm going to read from 3 to 8. So we understand kind of the bigger picture here. Paul writes, For our appeal does not spring from error or impurity or any attempt to deceive 
But just as we have been approved by God to be entrusted with the gospel, so we speak, not to please man, but to please God who tests our hearts. For we never came with words of of flattery, as you know, nor with a pretext for greed. God is witness. Nor do we seek glory from people, whether from you or from others, though we could have made demands as apostles of Christ. Here we are. But we were gentle among you, like a nursing mother, taking care of her own children. So being affectionately desirous of you, we were ready to share with you not only the gospel of God, but also our own selves, because you had become very dear to us. Christ cares for his body in the way that he's at work. And Paul here has a Christ-like love for the church, primarily with the gospel and in self-sacrifice. You hear him say, we gave ourselves to you. It's just like Ephesians 5.1, Christ loved sacrificially. 525, he loved and gave himself up for her. You hear Paul saying that same thing. We didn't come with a pretext for ourselves, husband. We are human. And sometimes we come to our wives with a pretext for ourselves. We come with something that seems loving, but in our heart, we are really motivated by making things better for ourselves. That's not Christ-like. If we're honest about that, that doesn't mean that we're not to be taken care of, but what it means is taking care of ourselves is not our primary thrust anymore. We are to trust our wives to take care of us, and she is to trust us to take care of her. We are to give sacrificially and put others before self. This word here in verse 7 of 1 Thessalonians 2 for um, like a nursing mother, that comes from the same root as to nourish. And when it says taking care of her own, that is the exact same word as to cherish, to take care of, to nourish, to bring up. You see how Paul was actively, positively, intentionally caring for the church and loving the church as Christ loved the church and husbands. And so you see these same words used for husbands. Husbands, love your wives this way. I just want to bring a, a few thoughts. You, you can tease these out, and I would encourage you to do this. But, but just, just to make sense of this in our homes, physically and emotionally and mentally and spiritually, how do we nourish? This is the idea of fueling or feeding, providing resources for life and growth. Bodily, we work hard to feed our families. That's part of loving your wife, making sure there's food on the table. That's part of it. That's not nothing. It's something to feed them emotionally, we pour into their hearts. We learn what speaks to them. If it doesn't make much difference, if you go out and buy her flowers, and don't expect her to be thrilled about that, but what if it means, what if it means something to her that you just put the phone down or, or get that chore done early or put it off and just spend 30 minutes or an hour sitting with her and talking with her or just listening to her? Or maybe she wants you to shut up and get off the couch and, and, and go get that job done or go take care of that thing on a honeydew list. It may not just be that she wants to boss you around. It may really be that acts of service speak to her that you love and care for her because you're willing to do this. But you need to figure out what works for your husband. What says, sorry, what says to your wife, I love you. We're all a little bit different. And so you intentionally find what says I love you in the loudest way. And there are a lot of good resources for this. You engage her mind and her thoughts and you listen to her thoughts and you don't dismiss them. And you don't, mm mm-hmm, yeah, mm mm-hmm, yep, I hear you. You you put things down and and you, you convey the idea that what she's saying from her perspective, even if you think you know better, even if you think you've heard it before, it doesn't matter. You feed her intellect by drawing that out of her and valuing what she gives you. And you minister to her with the word. That doesn't matter. You don't have to have a theological degree. You don't gotta know all the ins and outs. If you have a Bible, Bring it into your marriage. Read it out loud together. It does not matter what state you're in. It does not matter. If you're a husband, you're called to lead like Christ. And that is a spiritual command as well. You see to it that she has a steady diet of good spiritual food, not junk food and not poison. So yes, that's going to demand that you do some learning and you do some studying and walking with the Lord because there's a lot of spiritual junk food out there and there's a lot of spiritual poison out there. 
Don't starve your wife. Christ feeds us. Christ feeds the church with himself, union and communion with him. He feeds us living bread and living water with the spirit through the word. It is our food. And we may only get through nourish. I don't know. We have to, we have to do cherish next week. I don't know. I, I mean, you're going to have to come back if you want to get the whole picture. Under nourish, I would say there's, there's fuel and feed and there's also train and exercise. Some component where you are putting in to make better. To use and develop skills and abilities in preparation for or fulfillment of tasks. Think about Ephesians 2.10. We are created in God. We are God's workmanship created in Christ Jesus for good works, which he prepared beforehand that we should do. There is an aspect of nourishing that is training, that is exercise. We exercise our bodies, don't we? We learn new skills. We get better at doing them. We keep ourselves active. Stay active with your wife. Help promote her being active. Maybe that's going on a walk with her. Maybe that's saying, honey, I'll watch the kids. If you want to go on a walk by yourself, you want to work out, you want to exercise, you want to do something, then let me help provide a way so that whatever's keeping you from doing that no longer does that. And that's a sacrificial thing. You may not want to do that. But maybe you need to, to care, to train and exercise her body. What about her heart, her mind, her soul? Learn with her. Read a good book. Read something like, Gary Chapman's The Love Languages and learn how to speak a new language for her sake so that if you really do love her, she's actually hearing that. Saying, well, you know I love you while you refuse to do out of neglect or ignorance or intent. If you really want to communicate that you love this woman and figure out, study her and do it on purpose, Solve problems together, work. I'm not talking about crosswords. I mean, you could do crosswords together, but when there's an issue, invite her input, invite her thought. Don't just assume that she doesn't know what you're talking about. Value what she would have to say. There's some unique perspectives out there, gentlemen, that we're just not built for. It's just not going to occur to us that way. It doesn't mean you do everything she says but you show her that you value her mind and what she would bring to it and you don't neglect or put her out or just say, well, you're not capable. You train them. You exercise that. You encourage and support service and study and ministry with God given, within your God-given sphere. Maybe your, your wife is looking for a way to serve or you would encourage her. You say, well, we're not really serving in the church. What has God given you to work with? God's been gracious to show us that there are little kiddos out there in this community, in this family who need the intent, loving, care, and instruction. It's been a long time since we've had to deal with how as a church body do we support families with little ones. That doesn't mean that men are not included. I'm not saying that's women's work, but I'm saying God has uniquely gifted women in a way to nurture little ones. That we could learn to do better at, yes. But we should not neglect what God has gifted these ladies with. Encourage that sort of a thing. Don't discourage it. Don't neglect. Christ leads us into work, into ministries, into community, into trials with gifts on purpose to nourish, not just to feed, but also to train and to exercise and to grow our ability, our strength, and our skill What about cherishing? Cherishing, the two aspects of that that I think are helpful to us are protection and rest or restoration. To protect is to shelter, to defend from harm or loss or degradation. You need to guard the input that's coming to care for her bodily safety, for her security. When she says... Slow down. Trust me, let me just pause at this point in saying, I by no means have any of these things done perfectly. I am right there with you, fellas. The fact that I know that, that these are good things and that we're trying to be biblical does not mean that I have got all this figured out. I'm not, 
I'm still working on these. Still working on these. And sometimes this has not been a good one, right? When she's upset that I'm too close to one edge or the other. And I think, well, you know what? I'd rather be close to this shoulder than like, you know, hitting an oncoming car. Makes perfect sense to me. You need to just settle down. Or she says, slow down, right? What she's saying is, I have a fear and I don't feel safe. That needs to be valued, not laughed off. I've done it. I've laughed it off. But if I'm being serious about cherishing my wife, I need to hear what she's telling me. And it's not just slow down. It's I don't feel safe. And if I disregard that, then I'm not cherishing her in the sense of respecting her and protecting her. There are lots of examples. What about protecting her heart? Don't be harsh. Don't overpower her. Don't get loud up over her to put her down. That's not cherishing and protecting your wife's heart, be sensitive to whatever her need is. You may not understand that need. You may not have the same need, but when she expresses these things one way or another, it won't always be with words and it won't always be directly like, this is what I'm feeling with my heart. But if we care to protect her, she's always telling us something. We need to care and love her enough to protect what bothers her. Even if we think it's irrational, even if we think there's no need to be afraid, nevertheless, her heart has this need and we're to protect it. Protect her mind. Don't dismiss her thoughts. And she tells you something in confidence. That's not for the conversation at the water cooler or the sale barn or anywhere else. Protect her mind, her thoughts, her heart, her body. If you wouldn't want every other person viewing all of your wife's body, then don't show to them all of her heart and all of her mind by sharing what she told you in confidence with others. Watch over her soul, over the truth that she hears, over bitterness and sin that may reside and maybe she's hanging on to and maybe that's not right, but maybe it's because we have never said we're sorry or acknowledged that we have some role in this. Yes, maybe you were harsh and unloving with me and disrespectful of your husband, but I had some role to play in that probably. And we are called to be taking initiative. Doing what's right by our wives does not demand that they do something first. We are men in our homes. We are the head and we should set a lead by being the most Christ-like first and protecting our hearts, sorry, our wives' hearts and souls from harboring things like bitterness and unforgiveness. We should be dependent on Christ in all of these things and not act like we can step into his role and go dependent with her both to Christ when there is an acknowledgement and humility that I cannot do everything that you need, but we know together who can. You don't endanger or defile your wife. Christ is a refuge and a strong tower for us. He is faithful in his power and in his sovereignty. It dispels fear and it protects us. He protects the church. He's fought that battle. He goes in front. He's provided faithful, honest, true power and safety. We are to love and cherish our wives like that. Lastly, we are to cherish them by bringing rest and restoration. To provide and pursue relief or repair from stress, from the cares of this world, from the things that drain and wound us, our fears. Find a way to get away from what's taxing us. Bodily, sometimes that means you take part of the work or the load or you just get away. Or to rest the heart, you give without expecting in return. You do something that speaks to her heart, and maybe you intentionally, you don't give her the opportunity right away to repay you, and you make sure, right? You, you do something that you know is all for them, and you're not going to get anything back, and you love that. To show her that you're going to rest her heart from always feeling the need, because we do, don't we? When someone gives to us, we always feel the need to have to give back. How freeing would it be if someone gave to us and made it clear I don't need you to give me anything right now. This is just for you. This is just for you. Downtime for the mind. Maybe rest her mind by being open so she doesn't have to think about what you're thinking. What is he thinking? What is he going through? I just don't know. Don't make her work so hard to drag that out of you. Be open with her. That's not going to always go well. But if you're both committed, like verse 21 says, to submit to one another out of reverence for Christ, And you're both dependent on him because he's our ultimate rest. Then this will get somewhere better. 
honesty? What about resting her soul? Remember the Sabbath to keep it holy. Making sure that worship as a family through the week and on Sundays with the family of God is a priority and it's important and be a spiritual leader and step up. Don't make wives have to be the spiritual leaders in homes. It's not that they're not capable because they can't know things about God that we know. That is not what's going on at all. But this is the role that God gave to man to be a head and to lead in this way. Give her rest by doing what God called you to do, husbands. Don't exhaust her. Don't degrade her. Christ himself is our peace and has secured rest for us. All these things, the fueling, the training, the protection, the rest, they can all be found in and obtained from God's word. Don't neglect prayer, the reading of God's word, the preaching of God's word, the worship personally as a family and corporately with the body. In all these things, we learn also to receive the loving care and provision from Christ. He is completing that which he began. Husbands, draw from Christ as a wife from her husband because we are part of the bride of Christ. And in turn then, as Christ has loved you, you love your wife because you are his body and so is she and we are to love ourselves not first so that we can, but as we love our bodies, as Christ loves his body. God, give us strength and wisdom to encourage our husbands, to forgive and be patient and to support them and to be good and faithful husbands, to encourage other husbands and wives that we encounter if we are somehow not with or separated from our own. We all have a role to play in understanding how Christ loves us and sharing that with others. Amen.